Okay, so let's move to the first session. Uh, on my right, uh, actually, I'm the only person who does need an introduction. The rest are so famous and successful, they don't. But anyway, I'll go ahead. Um, Martha Lane Fox, entrepreneur, tech evangelist. She's a crossbencher peer and is currently chief of... Hmm? Not very cross. No. <laughs> She's the Chancellor of the Open University, head of Go On, which aims to help millions more people and organizations get online. I recommend her YouTube video of the excellent Dimbleby lecture this spring, which I think was one of the best I've seen. Then Ronan Don on my far right, CEO of Tele Telefonica UK, which is known as O2, who is also on the Guardian Media Group board, and therefore is a pal of Ian Allen's and was on the inside of the paper's business when the Snowden revelations were taking place. My great friend Alan Rusbridger, editor of The Guardian until last week, and soon to be, or maybe already, head of Lady Margaret Hall. Um, he has fought a number of very famous battles, not notably on WikiLeaks and um, Edward Snowden case, obviously, most recently. And the paper was under his editorship awarded the Pulitzer Prize, which is obviously extraordinarily rare in Britain. And Cory Doctorow, a brilliant and articulate science fiction author, campaigner for freedom um, on the internet, and co-editor of Boing Boing. So, first question to you all. We're starting at the beginning. Martha, when did you first see the web? The first time I saw the internet, I remember very clearly, went to a beautiful old university, got put into the smallest, most modern room at the top of a building you could ever imagine. It's a bit of a disappointment, but in walked a guy called Toby who introduced himself to me and said he'd just come back from Japan and he showed me on his small handheld device what the weather was doing in Tokyo and what the weather was doing in San Francisco. It seemed baffling to me and that was the internet. Did you, did you predict anything when you saw it? Did a penny drop? <laughs> I didn't predict that I would end up working anywhere near it. No, I didn't. And Ronan, what about you? So the first, uh, first time I really got close to the internet was actually um, uh, way back when, in all of 2002, um, the first ever, what was called a wireless PDA, was a thing called the O2 XDA, and was the forerunner of all of our current smartphones. And actually, um, it was called XDA because it was the crossover of voice and data for your digital assistant. And this was before we had a Facebook, a Twitter, a MySpace, any of these. And How so did you shop on lastminute.com? <laughs> <laughs> so this was the first time you could take this away on mobile. And you suddenly started to see the transformation that now is a lot more people access the internet on mobile than they do on fixed. 4.2 billion people around the world, which is more than have access to clean water or a toothbrush. It's amazing. I think I know when Alan did see the internet, because I was working in New York and somebody showed it to me in 92, 93, and then I think it was Mosaic or Netscape Navigator, and I think I came back and told you about it. And before I knew what, you were on the web and setting up the Guardian website. Is that about right? More or less. It was, it was 1993, um, and uh, I, I went to America and found this thing called the internet, which was a great surprise. Um, I remember going to, there was a and a company called Knight Ridder that had a, a lab down in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and we went all the way down to Boulder, Colorado. And all they had was a piece of wood um, about that size. It was very much like an iPad. Um, and they said, one day we will read all our newspapers on that. And I was completely convinced. I don't know why, because it was just a piece of wood. Um, <laughs> but they were. Um, they had obviously been closed down and abolished long before anybody invented the iPad. But they were strangely right. But Corey, you are slightly different from the rest of us. You're sort of early adopter from the age of five. Uh, six. So six, my, my father was a computer scientist who was uh, doing a degree at the Ontario Institute of Studies in Education in Toronto, where there was a PDP-11, a DEC computer, and he brought home an acoustic coupler, which is this, um, it looks like a sex toy for telephones. It has two suction cups, and you dial up on a rotary dial phone, and you, you, once you hear the scream, you put it, and they scream at each other. Uh, it didn't have a screen. It had a, a roll of paper and a daisy wheel printer, so you could only compute until the paper ran out. Uh, my mom, who was working in an elementary school, used to bring home rolls of paper towel from the loo, so we'd get 1,000 feet of brown paper towel, and you could compute both sides of it, and then you were done. <laughs> But I would love to know when, I mean, I think it, for me, the penny did take a long time to drop. Uh, I don't know about you, Martha. It, but when was the last minute dot-com founded? Well, 1997. 
six, seven. Seven, eight. Yeah, six, seven, eight. I think after my 1992, that was with my friend Toby's experience, then I ended up quite by chance working in a company that was looking at the media and telecom sector. And that was when my very first piece of work was called What is the Internet for BT? In fact, you could probably do the same piece of work now. But uh, ah. the, um, that was when the penny dropped for me yeah. because I suddenly could see it from a completely different perspective. Commercial or in terms of society? At that point, probably more I was thinking commercially, but um, sort of I was a techno-utopian probably more then and, you know, 21, so I kind of thought the world was always going to be better in the future and changed in the most positive and fabulous ways. So it definitely seemed like a democratic force for good. Did you have that hope, Ronan, that sort of slightly hippie-ish feeling of release and endless possibility? I think Martha was well ahead of her time. I mean, to put it in context, Pipex provided the first digital dial-up service in 1992. You know, so if you take 1997, 1998, the future may have been discovered, but it wasn't well distributed at that time. And I think most of us probably saw our first exposure to the internet actually in an office environment where some uh, uh, office uh, connectivity had been provided. And it was more a B2B tool in, in some respects or an education and, and uh, academic tool in those days. I think what really, and uh, forgive me, I'll go back to the XDA, but when you suddenly realize that actually you get um, Encyclopedia Britannica in your pocket and you can have it with you all the time, then you start to think about, well, what if? And, and for me, certainly, w what this revolution is all about is we're creating an information uh, economy and in the past, information was power. This is democratizing access to information. And we've had an agricultural revolution, an industrial revolution. And in each case, you have a technology shift followed by a fundamental behavioral and societal shift. We haven't yet seen, in my view, the behavioral and societal shift that will be occasioned by digital. So I think we're actually on the technology curve. The big change is yet to come. That's what we're talking about today, right? that shift. Alan, do you think the internet could have evolved in any other way than the way we know it today? Well, I, I, I don't know enough about the technology. I, I think that the, the big thing that's changed uh, as a, just as a user is, well, two big things. One, one is the thing that Ronan was talking about, which is the, the, as a journalist, obviously, or you're interested in, in the, the messages you're sending out. But I was always terribly interested in what the messages would be that would come back. Uh, and the, the, the web 2.0, when people could talk to each other and publish as, as well as respond to us, was for me almost more important than the birth of the internet. And I think Ronan's right that we, we haven't begun to realize what that means yet. Um, as, as a user, there, there was a kind of a heady moment early on when if you put a, a search term into Google, you got something back that wasn't somebody trying to sell you something. Um, <laughs> And, and, and that was sort of <coughs> wonderful. It was, you know, for people just interested in, in, in sort of finding things out. Uh, and now, nearly always, any search term is, 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 is now part of a commercial world of, of people trying to sell you stuff. Uh, and it would be wonderful to try and um, find an alternative. Maybe there is one, um, an alternative Google in, in, in which was more about knowledge and less about straight commerce. Corey, what about you? Do you think it could have evolved in an entirely different way and retained some of that openness and sense of boundless freedom there? Well, I mean, I'm not a historical determinist, so yes, of course, lots of different things could have happened. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I believe in the adjacent possible, so people have ideas for things like airplanes at periodic intervals through the whole of human history, but eventually some of those ideas get realized because we have material science and physics to kind of catch up with it, which is what, when people say you get railroads when it's railroading time, they don't mean that there's a mystical railroading energy in the air, they just mean that we have now attained the point where when that idea occurs with its on scheduled regular Regularity, that some of the people to whom it occurs will be able to figure out how to make it a reality. So I don't think we, we run on rails. I think we have lots of moments in our history where things have gone well and somewhere they've gone poorly. Uh, when the World Wide Web Consortium uh, decided that members who participated in standard setting would have to abjure web patents so there would be no toll gates for <coughs> producing web technology, that was a key juncture. It could have gone a different way. It could have been much worse. Um, but on the other hand, when the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed in 98 uh, and when the European Union Copyright Directive was passed in 2001, both of them produced extraordinarily bad policy that um, 
if we hadn't had it, I think things would be much better. They both provide for, among other things, an unaccountable system of arbitrary censorship and a rule prohibiting uh, disclosing security vulnerabilities in technologies that we rely on, which could have produced, uh, which, which does present a, a clear and present danger to us, uh, and which is only going to get worse unless we can do something about it. Data is the big subject, isn't it? Uh, Martha, I wonder, you've spoken in your Dibbleby lecture about a sense that we should be a, a Magna Carta for the internet, um, which would presumably involve data. But on a broader sense, how much do you think government should intervene and supervise the big web companies, try and control them, guard our rights, and so forth? How, do you think government should be more involved than it is? I think government should do three things, because I would argue that uh, we're actually having a bit of a crisis right now. You know, I just got stuck in hideous traffic coming across London. You know, London has an infrastructure problem, but the web has a much, much bigger internet, sorry, has a much, much bigger infrastructure problem, if you like. And I think the government should focus on three things. Firstly, we have got to improve the state of our digital infrastructure urgently. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that South Korea knock it out the park all the time in terms of the economy and productivity, partly because they have that super fast infrastructure. That's one big piece of the puzzle and somewhere that government could be more aggressive. Secondly, we have an absolute crisis in gender on the internet. Massive, huge, enormous. The percentage of women in the tech and creative industries, I saw a report just this week, have gone down. Mm. There are now nearly double the percentage of women in parliament that is probably marginally older than the tech sector. Double. It's a disaster. It's a disaster because power, money, product design, everything is worse and imbalanced and asymmetrical. So that's the second thing where I think they should intervene. And the third thing is in a, thank you, Bravo. in a broader, a broader, <coughs> A broader skills crisis, which I you know, worked on for a while, and you know, we still have massive issue with coding, the jobs that we need to fill, and a massive issue in broader digital skills, let alone the skills of our establishment and parliamentarians. And they are three, to me, very tangible areas that government could intervene. They don't even have to touch a big tech company to make a big shift in those areas. Ron, how do you, you, you must have a lot to do with government, really. Um, how do you find, I mean, one of the things that strikes me about government is most of the people making decisions are my age, and I absolutely know nothing about the web. Uh, the ISC, which is the Intelligence Security Committee, I noted in the last government, we had an average age of 59, and I don't think was one member of that committee that understood the issues. What's your experience of the sort of commercial end? Look, I, I think that's entirely right. I think we have to break it into two or three areas, though. So um, I think the management of critical national infrastructure needs to be done holistically. Digital infrastructure is an essential ingredient. We're happy, and it's not a criticism of HS2, but we're happy to spend 54 billion pounds on it. For a tenth of that, you would transform the digital infrastructure. The good or value-added product that will be most distributed around our economy in the next 20 years is not people going uh, an hour faster to Manchester. It's data, and yet we're not willing to provide the infrastructure for it. Second thing I would say is it's not just about the management of So I saw John Whittingdale this morning and talk about how we make sure that we all have better uh, connectivity. But one of our challenges is, uh, I went to the Common Select Committee in 2012 to talk about spectrum and talk about rural coverage. And John and I were admitted on record that more MPs write to him and me asking for a mast not to be built in their local community than ask for a mast to be built. Now that has changed. And I think the third thing, going back to the last point that Mark the made is this is not about technology. What we have is we have an analog society and we have a digital opportunity and we're singularly failing to match talent to opportunity in the way we educate and prepare our young people. And it's not just the education system itself, but it's parents, it's people of my age who have analog ambitions for their children. Simply the jobs that exist today and will for the next 10 years just didn't exist when those people went to school or went through university. So we have a fundamental change and it goes back to my overarching point is the pace of technology change has massively outstripped the pace of societal and behavioral change that's the crisis not a technology crisis Alan you've had slightly more difficult relations with government over the last three or four years um, I wonder I know a lot about it because I was you know with you on, on much of it but I wonder what you feel about government's true role I mean the internet presumably does have to be policed in some sense, but I wonder if you and then Corey could comment on the exact 
the limits to that sort of supervision? Well, I think there's been a missing stage in the debate. Um, so we, we, we seem to be operating on the basis that the digital world operates to completely different rules from the pre-digital world, and that, that just seems odd to me. So as an example, uh, over, over centuries, various groups and organizations, institutions, professions have built up uh, conventions uh, about what is confidential. Uh, doctors, uh, priests, uh, MPs, lawyers, uh, journalists. They, they, they all, for good reasons, believe that their conversations with their sources, their clients, their patients, their constituents uh, are confidential. Uh, and that's been built up over two or three hundred years. And somebody this year in the Home Office decided that actually that no longer counted. Uh, and that the, uh, the police on the, on the sanction of the Home Office would no longer respect any forms of privilege. That seems to me such a fundamental thing, in, in which is just somebody saying, well, this new world, because we can do this, we, we can abolish this, uh, we're going to give ourselves the power to do that. Uh, and that, in the year in which we celebrate Magna Carta, is such a profound change. Uh, and I just wonder why nobody thinks even to discuss it. Why, why, do, why do we assume that, that the new world is going to be different from the old world? Uh, and that digital is somehow this magical word which completely alters the relationship between government and citizen. Corey, you, you, are you in a very impassioned telephone call the other day with me and Hannah of, of Intelligence Squared. You were talking about how we can own the future still. It's not all negative, and, and, and I certainly believe that, but would you, would you enlarge on that? Sure. You know, I, I'm a, uh, I, I give a lot of talks about the future of technology and the present day of technology and what, what I think we should do. And at the end, somebody always puts their hand up and says, are, are you optimistic? And, you know, I'm a science fiction writer, and so I understand that predicting the future is a mugs game. Uh, science fiction writers are terrible at it, and science fiction writers who try are like drug dealers who sample their own product. It never goes well. Uh, but besides that, optimism and pessimism are, are largely irrelevant to what we should do. I mean, if you were convinced that in the future the internet was going to go from being the nervous system of the 21st century into being the world's most perfect and enduring surveillance apparatus that will harden our power relationships in ways that will deny opportunities to everyone save the tiny elites who are currently on top, you would get up every morning and get out of bed and do everything you could to change that fact. And if you were convinced that the internet wouldn't do that, you would get up every morning and get out of bed and do everything you could to ensure that fact. Right? So it doesn't change your course of action, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. So rather than optimism or pessimism, I'm a great fan of hope. Uh, hope is the idea that the future is up for grabs, that um, what we do today changes what happens tomorrow. Hope is why if your ship sinks in the middle of the sea, you tread water, not because most people whose ship sinks get picked up, but because everyone who's been picked up treaded water until rescue arrived. It's a necessary but insufficient precondition for a better world. And if you were along with someone else who couldn't kick for themselves, you'd put their arms around your neck and you would kick for them because that's what we do when we have hope. It gives us the strength to carry along the people around us. And people who know and care about this stuff, maybe in a minority today, we have not reached peak surveillance by any means, but we have reached peak indifference to surveillance. There will never be a moment at which fewer people are concerned about these issues than today. And so those people will start kicking with us if we, keep, if we keep at it, if we keep them afloat until the time arrives. So I do think that the future is ours to influence, if not to determine, and that um, when things look worst, that's the moment at which you can least afford to give up. Uh, the last thing, we, you know, we have to rush through this afternoon, there are lots of things. And I'd like to ask the panel, uh, I would love to hear from for the next hour and a half, but we can't. Um, I'd like to ask them, what is the single pleasure, the quintessential pleasure for them of using the web? Ronan first. Uh, I have a 21-year-old daughter who's at university in Australia, and I get to be with her through the internet by using uh, FaceTime or Skype. That's the best thing for me. Martha. 
uh, I walk with a stick. I can honestly say I'd have no clothes, no food. I'd be completely disorganized if it wasn't for the internet because it enables you to be at much more peak physical capacity than you actually are. It's quite profoundly personal <coughs> in that way for me. The thing I don't like is when I announce something at dinner and my children, who may be in the audience, or my wife fact-checks me immediately. <laughs> <laughs> that I hate. Alan, what about you? Well, I, I love that because I have this... Yeah. I have a, a terrible memory. I'm just a terrible memory. And you, if you've got a phone in your pocket, you don't need a memory. Um, and Google is a sort of hard drive that I carry around with me. And all the problems I had of not being able to learn dates or kings and queens of England, um, <laughs> I'm now super smart because I have it all there. Or actually, even I have it all there, but um, I, I haven't learned how to use it. I was going to ask yet. you about yeah. wearables. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, pe people who were uh, given an intelligence test, uh, or rather an, a knowledge test, um, were all asked, those that remembered um, from their brains and those who used Google. And the people who used Google thought they were more intelligent than the people who remembered simply using their brain, which is interesting how quickly we've absorbed this. Yeah. Corey, what's your great pleasure? So I, I love this business of having an outboard brain. Uh, you know, I, 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 just as having a calculator liberates you from being a shitty human spreadsheet and allows you to do real maths, having the internet liberates you from being a shitty human encyclopedia and allows you to do real synthetic thought. Every interesting thing that crosses my transom, and there's a seemingly infinite number of them, I turn into a post that explains to strangers why it's interesting. This is powerfully mnemonic. It joins this kind of super dense cloud of, of fragmentary ideas that kind of knock around in my subconscious and eventually two of them glom together and nucleate and turn into novels or speeches or essays. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to not have to bother yourself with the minutia and be able to look at bigger, more synthetic questions. That's a terrific way to end, and, and typically articulate. Well, thank you, panel. Thank you very much for a brilliant first session. I'm keeping the time, uh, the schedule, so um, we're all going to go off and be replaced by somebody else. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.